I'd like to begin by sort of just asking Rachel and Tony to um, tell us, so, was this what you expected? This has uh, been fantastic, and it, as, um, as mentioned at the beginning of, of the remarks, it's a really nice, uh, the two um, opening statements have been fit very nicely together. I guess I'm struck by um, the question of, of who acts that Tony, Tony raised that I, I think is echoed and, um, uh, and developed in, in, um, in the statement. And um, I guess it, it, as Tony expressed the question, um, we think about sort of which organizations act, but I think the other question is, is who acts in terms of um, who is at the table? Are women at the table? Are minority and disadvantaged groups at the table? And the question of how to, to bring them to the table and create space at the table in, in responding. Tony, any questions to Elizabeth Rain? Um, well, a, a, a comment, but then, but then a question. I, I was very much um, struck by Elizabeth's uh, uh, drawing on history. Um, the United Nations is itself a product of history. It is a product of a calamitous economic disaster in the 1930s. Uh, which then contributed to the outbreak of the Second World War. And then by a drive of the leaders of the time, who were in many ways more visionary than what we have today, uh, to create a body to prevent and resolve conflict and never to repeat what we saw in the 1930s and the 1940s. Um, Elizabeth rightly raises questions about the UN's role about the way forward for the UN. But the one thing that strikes me about the UN, and I've often sometimes been asked this question, why does the UN do economics? You know, economics, ah, economics is just economics. It's the global economy, finance ministers deal with that and so forth. The UN does that because there's a strong interaction between economic development, whether it's inclusive, and whether you then get a conflict because people feel excluded, there are economic drivers of conflict between states. So there are very strong reasons why the UN system tries to bring together economics and politics, because both are germane to building peace. But my question to Elizabeth Wren, in, in your very long experience, there's a new generation emerging of committed people, early career people, younger people who want to end the mistakes of the past, who want to move forward, what would be your recommendation to them? What would you advise them to do? Well, this is a, a tricky question. Uh, and uh, of course, uh, you should always use the way of putting tricky questions so that uh, you are really to think about that. I'm very sad about the fact that uh, those who are very smart uh, in business, in looking into the future, future finding the ways, uh, even if there is uh, economic disaster in the country and so on, they in some way avoid uh, both uh, politics and also uh, organizations like United Nations. We, we don't get, the, in some way, the smartest from that field, the smartest people to us. And uh, that's uh, very important to, to, uh, to see this. I have, been, um, I have an enormous family, and I have been trying to encourage. Only one daughter has come into the politics, but but all the rest, uh, they look at, uh, at me and say that they want to be normal people. <laughs> and, uh, and, and that is, uh, but that is, uh, it seems, uh, is of course meant like a joke. But it says quite a lot that, that um, there is some kind of division that uh, some are doing this and others are doing that. But it would be so. And I think that is what you mean, that it would be so important to really mix this up and get all the forces, all the important knowledge 
uh, also serving United Nations and, and the world in that sense. Uh, what you said about history, um, I'm, I am very much uh, reading history. I'm always looking back, I'm finding what was that and that. Uh, and it's not only the dates, you don't have to know the Battle of uh, Hastings or Poitiers or Magna Carta 1215 uh, or anything else. But you must know what is there behind. When I came to Kosovo for the first time in in '95, I met with um, Ibrahim Rugova and the others and uh, and then I was told that from somebody, but Elizabeth Rehn, don't you know the Battle of Kosovo Polia? And I said, of course I know it, but it's, uh, it was in uh, 1389, it's more than 600 years back. Oh yes, but you must understand that it has such an impact on everything that is happening today here in the country. And then I thought that, oh my God, but uh, uh, so history must not be allowed to be a, a total burden and binding you for 600 years uh, just for over. But uh, uh, we have to know what is lying there behind. It's a very difficult uh, mathematic operation to get this working. I'm sure there are lots of people who would like to ask questions. So I'm going to take three just to begin with, um, and then we'll have to see how much time there is. We'll start over there in that far corner. Uh, good morning and thank you very much. Uh, my name is Omar McDoom from the London School of Economics. I'm also a visiting fellow here at WIDA. Um, it's very nice to have a perspective from, if I may call you, a, a practitioner of crises. But as a practitioner of crises, I wanted to ask you about crisis fatigue and what it is that can still motivate policymakers and individuals' resources to take action even though crises continue and fatigue uh, resources and public opinion. We know that popular emotional responses to crises, whether it's a three-year-old who is found on the body of a beach or a five-year-old drawn from the rubble of a bombed out building, that this does motivate policymakers to take action. But what else, in your experience over the years that you've seen responses to crises, can also motivate policymakers to take action? Elizabeth, you want to respond now, or you want me to take the other we question? Take all of them. Sorry. Yeah, OK. So then we'll take here. Hello, good morning. I'm Soumya from India. So I, would, uh, I was thinking that some of the crisis, at least, is most sponsored by the government itself. Crisis. For example, crisis in India, in Sri Lanka, in Pakistan, mostly because the minorities do not have much say in the elected government. So how does UN see itself when it comes to these kind of crises? Okay, thank you. Richard? Thank you, I'm Richard Jolly from IDS Sussex. Um, I wanted uh, Elizabeth Wren, if I might, to ask you to respond to the Tony Addison uh, points. In other words, which do you see as the positive examples in the in, that you've been involved with or otherwise where there are lessons on how to uh, not only deal with the humanitarian crisis but start establishing the reconciliations afterwards? Richard, could I just ask you just to pass the mic just behind? I'm Kader Kondé from Jimmy Conakry. Um, public health uh, officer. My worry is that uh, United Nations is no more long, no more uh, longer adapted to the real situation now. We saw a lot of inequity, and how uh, the United Nations is still uh, uh, not adapted to the reality. Do you see a new challenge to change? United Nations in order to have better life in, uh, in the world. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think that we will allow Elizabeth now to try to address these uh, four wide-ranging questions. 
Uh, yes, the ethics of crisis. Uh, in one way, there is no ethics, uh, but but um, it's um, uh, it seems to be so that when the the war, the conflict is going on for a long period, and the people are already totally tired. They don't want to have the war. They have. Uh, the mass, those who are the victims of the war, uh, they only want to get rid of, of what's happening. But there is, of course, uh, some kind of, uh, of uh, not giving up. I will not be the loser. I must go on because I won't be the victor of, of, of this, uh, this, what is happening. And uh, then you start to see with with uh, all the legislation, all the conventions we have to gay today, the international criminal courts and other um, uh, tribunals, that uh, I don't want to give up because certainly soon I'm facing also to to stand trial. Uh, that is the new one that uh, ICC, even if it has a lot of shortcomings, though has some kind of of um, importance, and and then it's also the greed, uh, the greedy uh, uh, part of this that uh, that you want to have the political power, you want to have the uh, the richdoms of the country, like the African states who many of them have the diamonds, they have the gold, they have the coltan, like in in um, uh, DRC, Eastern DRC. It's so much, again, uh, about all of this. So the, the war is prolonged. And even if uh, there have been already peace agreements, it's no uh, going on in some way. It's very difficult for me to understand how, how this can still be done in the way like we have seen now in Syria five years, and we believe that it could be sold already when Kofi Annan was a mediator uh, without any kind of support from the uh, General Assembly and Security Council, unfortunately. And, uh, and then when we look at the minorities, uh, I think that the United Nations role is especially to safeguard the minorities, uh, minorities against their, uh, their um, governments. Uh, if UN has been successful, is some, some other. Some uh, positive remarks. I have seen a lot of positive things. Uh, I would like to take Rwanda as one positive example in the sense that that even if much is wrong, and um, I think that the President Kagame is not altogether a saint, but but he but he to try to be diplomatic. But at least after the misery, when eight hundred thousand men were killed, some women too, and five hundred thousand women were raped, uh, and uh, and that was also very much a, an order from the from the radio uh, that especially if you are uh, have HIV you should rape as many women as possible. So it was a very efficient way of also kill people in the long run because many were killed, but. In spite of all these, uh, they understood after the war that every uh, every knowledge, every uh, talent must be taken now in use. So women came also so strongly in the administration, in the uh, in the courtrooms, in the police, in as mayors of the even of of the. Uh, uh, Kigali, and uh, and it's uh, 
And then women started to be elected to the parliament. Today, I think 60% of the parliament in Rwanda are women. Uh, so that it has been from the disaster, it though has grown up, and they have a, a national growth uh, that is uh, very high. Uh, if you uh, look at what is happening in the growth of the states in Europe, for instance. So that could be a good, good uh, uh, example with all the miseries, of course, that are around. Uh, but at least uh, the democracy is having some kind of role in, um, and there are other examples. Now I really look at this with the Colombia that they have come to finally to an end on, hopefully an end of the cocaine war. Thank you very much. These themes, of course, will be continuing throughout our discussions and deliberations the next two days, the rest of today and the whole day tomorrow, and hopefully well beyond. Thank you very much for your patience. Um, a warm thanks to Elizabeth Rain. Thank you to Ravin. And now, please do enjoy your coffee and tea. Um, and may I finally request that we all try to get the parallel sessions going uh, after coffee at 11. Thank you much, everybody.